Hello and welcome. As a nun, she was immersed in the Roman Catholic religion, but then decided to expand her horizons and study other faiths. Her best-selling books on comparative religion have now become essential reading in many theology courses. This week on 101, meet the writer and commentator on religion, Karen Armstrong. Born into a family of Irish descent living in the English Midlands, she had a fairly uneventful childhood, although the young Karen Armstrong did witness her father going through some tough financial times that shaped her view on life later. She found her early school years tough and at quite a young age decided she wanted to escape the rat race, joining a convent to become a nun with the strict society of the Holy Child Jesus. It was an experience that triggered much of Armstrong's rejection of institutionalized religion and the search for a deeper and broader faith. She gave up an academic career to write about her findings, and the many fans of her best-selling books find her pragmatic perspective on religion something of a relief from the preaching of hardline conservatives in the religious world. Strong global support from her readers has prompted Armstrong to continue to push for greater understanding and tolerance between the world's various faiths. Karen Armstrong, it's such a delight to have some time with you. Thank you. Thank you. I love this expression you have to describe yourself, that you're a freelance monotheist. Explain what that is. Well, um, that was a remark I made in a light-hearted way, um, and it sort of dogged me uh, ever <laughs> since. I sometimes wish I hadn't said that. What I meant was that I've uh, studied uh, the three monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam now, for about 20 years, and I draw nourishment from all of them. And I cannot see any one of them really as superior to any of the others. Well, let me ask you one thing, that with all that study you've done, the writing you've done over the years, and you have studied these very thoroughly, what do you feel is the one lesson you have learned? Um, there are two, I think, if I may. One, uh, that um, belief, accepting certain doctrines, uh, is not very important. Our word belief in English meant commitment originally. It meant it was much more action-oriented. And that many of these so-called doctrines that we have, say, in the Christian world, like Trinity and Incarnation, began originally as a call to action, um, rather than just the acceptance of a, a particular idea. And the second thing is that all the world religions insist uh, that there's something wrong with your spirituality if it doesn't lead you to practical compassion, to a profound respect uh, for, the, uh, for other people, uh, seeing other people as, as sacred, inviolable and unique. That leads me to ask you, is it easy to discuss religion nowadays or has, has extremism and, and sort of extreme views, have extreme views taken over too much? Uh, well, no, there's, I, th I still find that, that there's a, wherever I go in the world, in, whether it's in Pakistan or United States or, um, or Europe, uh, people are hungry for a, a religious voice. They, they want to hear about religion um, and, and they're well aware that extremism is uh, the position of an extreme few. Um, I think, too, in England it's not so easy because England is a very, very secular country. Um, and among the chattering classes, it's almost de rigueur not to talk about religion. I mean, people actually ask me not to mention my work when I go around for dinner. So um, I think there, the, it's, it, among the chattering classes here, religion is seen as passé. Uh, but that's not so in, in either the United States or Canada or the Muslim world, not at all. A lot of people say that uh, religion is the root of all conflict. You know that it's it's if looking at any conflict going back, you can put you know put the cause down to religion. Is that the case from all the research you've done? No, it isn't. Um, I thought I used to start out with that um, attitude myself, and I've lost count of the number of taxi drivers who, when I jump into a London cab, ask me what I do for a living, and I and, and then they tell me quite categorically that religion's been the cause of all the major world in history wars in history. Well, um, the major cause of, of war and conflict is greed, fear, cruelty, envy, um, hatred, ambition. Um, and 
It's true, however, that religion and other ideologies, secular ideologies too, have often been used to sort of give these uh, rather self-serving and very destructive emotions a sort of, uh, a, a sort of some kind of legitimacy. Uh, and that's unfortunate. But in fact, no. I mean, I think largely uh, the wars ha have been caused largely by state structures, by economic disparity, by greed for other people's uh, riches and wealth. And that's still the case today. Uh, but religion, especially where a conflict becomes drawn out, such as has happened, say, in the Arab-Israeli conflict, uh, religion gets sucked in in the end and becomes a part of the problem. Well, let's take you back. Your family's of Irish descent. You were born in uh, Widmore in Worcestershire uh, before they moved, I think, soon when you were still young to, to Bromsgrove and then Birmingham. Yes. What were those early childhood years like? Oh, they were OK. I mean, um, I, we, I, I wasn't from a very religious family. We were Catholics, uh, but we didn't take that very seriously. So my decision later to become a nun was appalling. It was lovely growing up in the countryside. Uh, and I, I, I used to be taken out for walks in the afternoon with my sister in the pram and there'd be a sort of a being, a, a fairy or someone in every tree or every grove. And it was my way of uh, sort of sacralizing and making myself at home in my own landscape, I think. Uh, then when we were about 10, we moved into the city of Birmingham. Um, and uh, But we had a lot of ground. I mean, we, our, our garden looked led directly into a park. So there was plenty of space to, to, to run around and enjoy the natural world. Um, I was, um, I found school appalling. Uh, it was a mixture for me of both boredom and terror. Uh, we were con constantly sort of frightened by our teachers into behaving well. And I would look at the clock, wondering how it could pass so slowly. Uh, except in the last two years, then suddenly I began to see the point of learning and reading because I was concentrating on the subjects I liked the best. Now, in terms of your family, your parents, uh, the kind of influence they had on you, how do you think they shaped your character, each of them? Um, my parents uh, were a rather wonderful couple. My father was 20 years older than my mother. My mother was very young when she had me. My father became a, a Catholic rather to please my mother, I think, and for social reasons than from any sort of deep conviction. They were very, very sociable. Uh, they loved having parties and uh, they had very little money and what little they had they, they actually lost. My father um, went bankrupt when I was uh, about 14 or 15 which in those days was a real real disgrace. But my mother was kind of an inspiration really because she had to go to work uh, to sort of eke out the family finance and she'd had no uh, training, no qualification at all but she was very clever and she got a job in Birmingham University in one of the departments of the medical school. And by the end of her time there, when she left at 65, after 35 years there, she was running the department administratively and her research was in the byline of medical articles. Uh, she, and after that, she, lit, she went and did um, uh, a university degree, at the, did, doing her first examination ever at the age of 67. So it was rather a matriarchal family. The women were often the strongest people there. And um, my grandmother, too, was... I'm very like my grandmother. Both I'm small in stature, and the rest of my family are extremely tall. All the cup hooks were far out of my reach when I was growing up as a child. But my grandmother was very, very funny, very witty. Uh, she had problems, and I think a lot of that problem was due to boredom. Um, I think uh, I've been so fortunate in being able to be educated and uh, take, have a career. I think I don't know what, what I would have been like without, without that. I wonder with the, the difficulties you saw your family going through with your father's bankruptcy and, and your mother having to work, how it shaped you, how it made, uh, how, how at least it influenced what you might do in the future, what you were thinking of what might do. Well, it, it influenced me to become a nun apart from anything else. It was, I lived in Birmingham, which is a very materialistic city. Um, all the talk was about money and status. And it was quite noticeable that when my father was in trouble, uh, we lost a lot of our friends overnight. Uh, there were remarks made at school, for example. 
and the fact that my mother went out to work, which is in the 1950s, was pretty unheard of. And I was, uh, the nuns actually took me uh, on as on reduced fees and a Catholic charity paid for my education. And I could see that this was not a value that I, I, I wanted anything to do with. And so at the age of 16, I decided that I wanted uh, a life that wasn't dedicated to materialism and money and all these false values and that I would enter a convent and I would become sort of Buddha-like and serene and uh, holy and inspiring and it didn't actually happen. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, that was, that, and I think that, that, that experience really pushed me towards that. It was the Society of the Holy Child Jesus that you were yes. with. And what was what was life like in that environment? People sort of know the stereotype, uh, you know, image of it. But was it was it that kind of very isolated and closed off environment? It was isolated. Uh, we were deliberately, while we were being trained, uh, uh, kept away from any news or newspapers. They did tell us, for example, about the Cuba crisis, the Cuba Missile Crisis in uh, 1962, which happened just after I entered. Uh, because the world seemed about to end. They thought they'd better notify us, but then they forgot to tell us that the uh, crisis was over and we weren't supposed ever to ask for news of the world. So for three weeks, we were left scanning the horizon for mushroom clouds until finally one of us snapped. So it was that kind of isolation. When I left uh, the religious life in 1969, I'd never heard of the Beatles, for example. I'd never heard of Vietnam which my fellow students at Oxford were very exercised about. I knew none of the names of politicians. So it was isolated. Uh, it was also tough. Uh, people who read my book say it reminds them of boot camp. Uh, and, it, and that's uh, not as out, uh, odd as you might think because it was a Jesuit order. We had the Jesuit rule and St Ignatius had been a soldier. And his idea was to make Jesuits uh, soldiers of Christ that would obey simply like that, not asking why or wherefore. Um, and when you're being trained as a soldier, uh, you know, you have to be toughened up. And so there, it, it was, and I think what ultimately uh, made me decide to leave was uh, that it was not a kind place. And increasingly, I began to feel that this had very little to do with Christianity or the Gospels. Um, and, but I wouldn't have missed that time, not for anything. I wouldn't be here talking to you now if I hadn't done that. It started me out on some kind of quest. I, I read that you said it, it literally drove you to being suicidal though, at one point. Uh, not, that was after I left. Uh, this is what you we had in those days and it wouldn't happen now because I was trained before the reforms of the Second Vatican Council came into effect and that did drastically change the way young nuns were trained um, but I, I so I had the old system at its very last gasp but it did need it need reform but it was a form of conditioning um, and once I left the convent, I found it impossible to exist outside that environment. I'd been conditioned for that, and though I didn't want to die particularly, I didn't know how to live. And I entered a state, I think, of uh, extreme depression, a sort of grief, like for about six years. Uh, rather like you might have after a, a bereavement or a, a, a very painful divorce. And I also had the problem that I was having all kinds of symptoms uh, of terror. Um, I would suddenly be engulfed in terror or I'd go out somewhere and um, be suddenly end up in a completely different place from where I'd intended to go. Fortunately, I always ended up in a quite edifying place like the Tate Gallery or something. Uh, but uh, they, th this was later discovered uh, to be a, a temporal lobe epilepsy uh, as a birth injury on that temporal lobe which interferes with memory and emotion and fills people with this kind of in all engulfing dread and fear. So I thought I was losing my mind really um, and the diagnosis of that epilepsy was one of the happiest days of my life I must say. You found a cause, yeah. Well then I had some medication and I knew what was causing it. Um, so there were, those were, were really, really difficult years. 
And you'd gone from being a nun in this isolated environment to St. Anne's College in Oxford, of yes. course, in a totally different environment, of course, you know, at, at a time when things were very outgoing and liberal. Well, it was 1968, the summer of love in Oxford. <laughs> Not that I was participating in that. I was far too, uh, still it's still a, a nun in my in my head and in my mind. And there were, St. Anne's was a very political college, so there was a lot of demonstration about Vietnam and, and, and uh, endless uh, uh, war against the Oxford authorities and demands to change the syllabus. So at that time you decided, you know, while at Oxford that's it, no, no more being a nun. Was it a sense of giving up on religion as such? No, that didn't come for about six or seven years afterwards. When I remember waking up, I moved to London to take up a job at London University for a while and um, I remember on the first Sunday I woke up in my London flat and I thought I'm not going to church. That's it. Uh, I tried to get in touch with God for all those years. I'd failed. I was completely unable to pray. Um, the kind of prayer that we were taught in the convent was not my kind of prayer. Uh, it, it didn't suit me and the heavens remained closed. I think I had an inadequate idea of God uh, and was expecting things that were impossible. Um, and, and I just found prayer utterly boring and tedious. So I just let it all go. And I thought that was it. I thought from now on, that's the end of me and religion. I, if I used to see somebody on the London Underground reading a book on religion, I used to feel positively ill, never dreaming for a moment that I would be writing these, some of these books at a later stage. You wrote your, your experiences in, in the convent, uh, in your book, Through the Narrow Gate, which I gather actually made you quite a target for some sort of devout or even, I guess, you know, hardline Catholics. Yes, uh, especially in this country. It's not so in the United States, where Catholicism is more relaxed. But Catholics in England definitely feel rather ghetto-like. There's been centuries of persecution here. And so, and there's also, most of us are Irish, and that means that never, never, we never really feel quite English either uh, because of the problems between Ireland and, uh, and Britain. So uh, when one of somebody breaks ranks and, as it were, washes dirty linen in public, that uh, I've never been quite forgiven uh, by that, though I have been very much embraced by my old religious order, which is uh, in recent years, which has uh, been very wonderful, uh, a nice reconciliation there. Now you did, uh, before the writing, you did think about a career in academia, and uh, I know you had that kind of bit of a, you know, with, uh, with London University, a bit of fuss over the PhD. Well, not, not a fuss, it was Oxford University, Oxford University and sorry. I failed it. Um, and I failed it in a rather odd way. The university decided the, it hadn't been properly examined. Uh, but they decided that the sanctity of the Oxford doctorate meant that it couldn't be re-examined. Uh, so that was the end of my academic career. And that was awful because I was just beginning to recover from the convent. I thought that this was something that I could do. And then to have that sort of very notorious and public failure, the row about this went on for five months while they decided what to do with me. So that was another awful thing. But in fact, I'm very glad now in retrospect, because my aim had been to teach English literature. And I'd now be teaching English literature uh, in somewhere like Reading or Aberystwyth. Or, uh, but in fact, I've had a much more interesting life, that, uh, and I think a more useful one. Uh, and, 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 and I don't think the academic world would have suited me. Um, it's a bit narrow. Uh, this, uh, the kind of writing that I do is not in fashion with academia. I take these big subjects, and in academia you polish a little tiny area. So I think actually that was that bad failure nudged me into a different direction, a better direction for me. What was it that triggered the writing for you? What was it made, that made you want to write about religion? Oh, well, I wrote my first book uh, simply because people said, you really ought to write about this. And then I lost my teaching job. My, my life uh, for, uh, until, for the first 50 years of my life consisted of one disaster after another. I'd be going along, let's say, in the convent, uh, then in academia, and the, the whole thing would collapse after about six years or so. Um, and I was a school teacher, and then because of my epilepsy, I was asked to leave. And then I wondered what on earth I was going to do, having been invalided out of teaching. And then I got a telephone um, uh, call from uh, Channel 4 television, which had just opened up. They'd never do this now, 
but they asked me if I'd like to write and present a six-part documentary on St. Paul, working with an Israeli film company in Jerusalem. Well, of course, I said yes, and here I was, unemployed. Um, I knew a little bit about St. Paul, but not much. But I thought I could learn on the job, and indeed I did. I had a... Uh, but the big thing was I went to Jerusalem. And it was that trip to the Holy Land that really changed a lot, didn't it? It completely changed things. Uh, first of all, I knew when I arrived, I knew nothing at all about the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, but immediately, uh, you're thrown into it. Uh, but also, I start. I when you're in Jerusalem, uh, you're rubbing up against both Judaism and Islam. Religions that I knew absolutely nothing about. Uh, my uh, Catholicism had been very parochial. We didn't even think Protestants were really on the map as Catholics. Um, but when you're in Jerusalem, I, I, I had to do, a, you, you see these faiths, you realize their profound interconnection with each other uh, at the same time as you realize their profound differences. Um, and I st and started learning uh, about them all three and developing something that I call triple vision to try to see them all three at a tangent because some of the worst atrocities have happened when one religion gangs up on the other or when two faith traditions gang up on a third. And uh, so I, I, I started writing about that. I, my relationship with the whole... Uh, whole meaning of religion, I think, started to change. Now begs the question, what difference do you think the work has made, the, the books you have done? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. People tell me you've changed my life and you, no, I, you know, it's in, in Muslim audiences that, you know, people are so enthusiastic, some of them, not all, about my work. Uh, and it's something that I, I, you don't, when you're writing, you don't, really think of what effect you have. The, just the, the struggle, the jihad, if you like, of, of writing a book is itself so all-absorbing, all-consuming. Now, when you won the prestigious uh, TED Prize in uh, 2008, you, you soon after set up the uh, Charter for Compassion. Explain that, who supports it and what it's supposed to achieve. Well, um, TED, they give you, when you, TED conferences, when they, when you win their, one of their prizes, uh, they give you some money, but more importantly, they give you a wish for a better world, which they will help you to come about, to, to bring true. And I knew almost immediately what I wanted, because as a religious historian, it's long been a frustration to me uh, that the religions all preach the ethic of compassion. That doesn't mean feeling sorry for people or uh, gusts of sentimental emotion. It means treating others as you would wish to be treated yourself. And so the religion should be making a major contribution to the chief task of our time, which is to build a global community where people can live together in harmony and respect. And it seems to me that unless now we learn to implement that golden rule globally so that we always treat all peoples, even our so-called enemies, as we would wish to be treated ourselves, we're not going to have a viable world. So I asked Ted to help me to create this charter. It was uh, contributed to by hundreds of thousands of people online on a multilingual website. Uh, it was actually written and composed by uh, leading activists in six of the major world religions, Muslims, Christians, Jews, Hindus and Buddhists and a Confucian. Um, and it's, it, it's to, its aim was to restore compassion to the heart of religion and moral life. I'd like it to be cool to be compassionate, for it to be one of those buzzwords, but also the charter was primarily a call to action. And I'm happy to say in a way that uh, Ted never expected, it's taken off in ways that we wouldn't have dreamed. Um, and we're starting now a campaign to create an, an international network of compassionate cities. Uh, we've already got on board Seattle, which declared the charter last year. Louisville in Kentucky is following. Uh, but there are about 50 people going, 50 cities worldwide, going through the process now. And one of the things that I insist on is that a compassionate city must have a global outreach, must be doing something to create global understanding and awareness. I'm thinking, for example, of twinning cities, so that Lahore could twin with Chicago, for example. And so uh, 
that, 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 so that this, I can start to break down some of these barriers of ignorance and distance and prejudice that are often, I'm afraid to say, fanned by the media, uh, which often presents the most negative things about, about, each, about ourselves. Well, let me ask you how you'd like to be remembered, what you'd like your legacy to be. A peacekeeper, I think. Someone who's helped people to try to understand one another at a difficult point in history. Karen Armstronger, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much.